when old Bai Jang gave a talk, <laughs> an old man was there listening together with the others. When they left, he left too. One day he stayed behind. Indeed, he said, I am not a human being. Very good. So, um, the two animal koans tangled up with each other, and one of them is that one, the fox. Indeed, I am not a human being. Which I always thought was one of the good lines in the koan cricket. <laughs> you meet somebody in an alley and they say, Indeed, I am not a human being. <laughs> Can you hear okay? Yes. Elmo in the back, John? Yeah. Uh, In a way, it's true of all of us, you know. Indeed, <laughs> I'm not a human being. So, and uh, when I was, <coughs> I guess, at some stage, some of the dojos I trained in, uh, every session started out with the comment of the dog. And it started out, um, was just recited and uh, everybody in the room could recite it, recite it. and it, uh, a monk asked Jao Jo does a dog have Buddha nature or not? Jao Jo said no. And they always use the Japanese mu which is an old old uh, it's a Chinese pronunciation from like 1200 or something. The Chinese call it Wu now. But um, it's a Chinese dirty as to say Wu. Uh, but it um, means no, so we say no. <laughs> so, does a dog have Buddha in nature or not? No, said Chao Zhou. So, um, and it's interesting to think of it. I never knew what to make about the dog because I never had any problems about dogs and Buddha nature, personally. And um, the, uh, but in a certain way, it makes sense to me now that, uh, and uh, so the dog, the thing about it is part of you, you know, so that's a good thing, the dog. So you can tell I'm going to talk about the dog to me. And, um, and it's part of some part of you that you probably pretend you're not, you know. It's obviously a shadowy part of you because dogs are very, I don't know, they're very loving and amiable and vicious when they need to be, just like that. So they're very dog-like. So, um, and I always like people who know about them. So, you know, people who know that they have a shadow and can be pissed off or heartless or loving or reckless or whatever they are, they're, they're kind of, it's good to know, that, you know, it's kind of nice when people know that and it's a lot easier in Zen when people are being virtuous, you know, because a virtuous is always something that's not actually about virtue, you know. It's, image thing. So um, dogs have something to be said for them in that way. And they have very big hearts, you know, when you're close to a dog. So I want to read, I want to do the common. And it occurs in two places in our common curriculum, in the, the Muen Khan, uh, the no gate, and it's the, that's the Wu, the no, no gate gate or barrier. Women won in Chinese. And that's the one we um, were subjected to on the first night of session. Actually it was the second or first night last night. You know, things change, you know, but the first night was given entirely to rules. Don't look at people, don't, you know, I can't remember what they were. It shows says something about my character, likely. But um, yeah, don't look at people. Don't turn around. Don't speak. Don't whatever. Don't make 
social greetings. You know. But anyway, it went on and on and on. And, uh, you know, I'm a pretty good meditator, so I just sort of, you know, you just meditate through that stuff. But, um, so, a monk asked Jaja, does a dog have Buddha nature or not? Jaja said, no. And women, no gate. So, um, some of the uh, Chinese translators have started translating out those names, like Mumon or Wu Men means no gate. So, no gate, so, you know, uh-huh. which sometimes is helpful and sometimes incredibly confusing. So, you know, so. For the practice of Zen, it is imperative that you pass through the barrier set up by the founding teachers. For subtle realization, it's of the utmost importance you cut off the mind road. You know what mind road is? That's it. Cut it off. <laughs> there. <laughs> if you do not, so you can see the whole point here, you're throwing yourself into this and then everything else stops. The mind road, there's no traffic. The ghosts are not moving at midnight. There's just no, just the call. Okay. Okay. Um, not so hard. If you do not pass the barrier of the ancestors, if you do not cut off the mind road, then you are a ghost clinging to grass and trees. You just move about by the wind, you're not really, you know, don't stand on your own legs. What is the barrier of the ancestral teachers? It's just this one word, no, the one barrier of our faith. We call it the gateless barrier of the Zen tradition. When you pass through this barrier, you will not only interview Jalja intimately, you will walk hand in hand with all the ancestral teachers in the successive generations of our lineage. If you've heard of a great teacher in which you study with that person and now they're dead, you walk hand in hand with them. Fair enough. I'll take it. Um, uh, <clears throat> the hair of your eyebrows entangled with theirs. So. That looked you know, really face to face with you. But then he goes on to say, seeing with the same eyes, hearing with the same ears. So you become a person now. Um, which is kind of interesting. That's a whole thing that happens in, in Zen meditation where some people say, well, I don't know who I am, but also you're all of that. You know, that's one of the things. If, you, if you're sitting in my seat and people come in for interview, then one of the things you notice as people start to like wake up, um, they're not so stuck in the me. You know? And you can sort of tell if someone's had an experience, even if they don't really know it, you know. Um, what do they know? It's just their life, you know. So, um, and um, teachers in the successive generations of our lineage, the hair of your eyebrows entangled with theirs, seeing with the same eyes, hearing with the same ears. Wouldn't that be joyous? Ah. Is there anyone who would not want to pass this barrier? So then, make your whole. This is the, this is an interesting instruction. This is not what you people usually think. You'd be very gentle and mindful and stuff like that. To hell with that, he says. Make the. <laughs> this is Zen. What do you think this is? Bush week. Um, <laughs> so then, make your whole body a mass of doubt. So that's the dog thing, isn't it? You sign with the thing you thought was the problem. So you enter the thing that you thought was the problem. Mm, you know, it's kind of turning into the difficulty, you know, the trouble, you know. And with your, anybody who did anatomy in the room will have problems with this next bit, but uh, your 360 bones and joints and your 84,000 hair follicles, but you know, you, a very large number of both. A whole bang, a whole shebang, a whole lot. Um, 
Concentrate on this one word, no. Day and night keep digging into it. Don't consider it to be nothingness. Don't consider it, don't think of it in terms of has or has not. Don't consider it to be yes or no. You know, just keep entering it, entering it. It's like swallowing a red hot iron ball. You try to vomit it out, but you can't. That you, I don't know. That, like you can't, in a certain stage, you can't get rid. If you're really deep in the practice, you can't sort of get rid of it. But it's not quite there yet. But you can't get rid of the damn thing either. You know, and <laughs> and it's a beautiful thing that you realize. Oh, I'm being carried by something greater than. I would have thought you know, that's a very important part of practice. Be carried by that which is greater than my motives and, and skills and schemes, and my prestige and my honor and how important I am. It's really much greater than all that. And so that's what the modesty of, of the modesty of Zen practice is that you know you have to. The great Khan is greater than you and starts carrying you. Um, and then gradually, this is the purification part of the practice. You notice it, some people came in today and said, Wow, the session's already like, you know, my mind is not as tangled as it was. You know, that's the purification process, and you just feel it happening. It's okay if it's more tangled than it was, too, it's just happening differently. But, um, that's entering the trouble. But um, you'll notice that, that you sort of get washed, you know. Uh, gradually you purify yourself, eliminating mistaken knowledge and attitudes you have held from the past. You know, you know that, isn't it? Like one of the attitudes we hold is I've got to compare myself to other people, for example. Yeah, I like, you know, and that's one of the big things, isn't it? You walk into a room and, you know, you don't like a picture and uh, plus it wasn't hung very well. And, um, or whatever it is, you know, and you're comparing yourself to someone. You know, why do they, why do they think they're important? I'm the important one. Because that's, that's not said, I'm modest. They think they're important. Um, anyway, you know what I mean. It's just, it's called being a human being. You know, and the comparing and contrasting. The, um, I have this friend who is not here now, so he can tell the story. And um, <laughs> no one will recognize anything, but he's a very modest, kind of thoughtful person. He's a bit like a monk, you know. I mean, not in that one, but he's a very modest, quiet person. And so I gave him. I don't know, some intuition instead of giving this kind of no. Because you've noticed, like, you know, we, well, I sometimes give people a different first kind, like the light, what is your light, is equivalent, uh, the comment, same kind, actually. As, uh, what is, um, I said, huh. I said, well, what really goes on inside your mind when you're being so nice? He said, I'm really comparing myself to everyone. <laughs> it was really sweet. And I said, so I hadn't just come, the true person has no rank. Yeah. And he tells the same thing, as no. Yeah, the dog have with a nature or not? No. Are you important? The true person has no rank. <laughs> so anyway, back to no and dogs and things. Um, You eliminate mistaken knowledge and attitudes you've held from the past. That would be the mistaken knowledge. You know, whatever the social stances, I have to charm everybody. Uh, I have to flee everybody. I have to be paranoid. Whatever, whatever your thing is, you know. Um, and it doesn't say that's bad. It just says it's sort of like it's not you, and it falls away. And. Uh, Inside and outside become one. So that's one of the big interesting things. You have these moments when you look at a tree and you realize, oh, it's sort of somehow, it's got something to do with me, the tree and me. And you notice with the night sky, perhaps, my grandfather spoke of like uh, being on the 
Decorator, a ship long ago, and like looking up in the night sky and, and sort of being part of it, being overwhelmed by it. He had no <coughs> particular mystic aspirations, but it was something he thought he would pass on to me about life. You know? And, uh, and you, you know what that is, don't you? You really look at it. You, some people get it with a flower, you know. Um, Buddha twirled, in Zen legend, Buddha twirled a flower to teach the Dharma. You're like a person who cannot speak, who is mute, who has a dream. You know it for yourself alone. There's a great example of this in traditional common story where um, great young man had a you know, pretty talented student who stayed with him for 18 years, and every day young man had asked him, what is it? What's it now? It's a dog. <laughs> he'd ask him some dumb question every day, and the guy would he'd do his best, and he'd go away, and he'd read, and he'd quote long things from the sutras, and he'd quote clever responses that other teachers had given, and young man, he, young man wouldn't even answer, you know, it's like, and then they'd go about their day, and he was his secretary and stuff. So, and then one day, after 18 years, he said, I get it. And you then said, great, tell me. And the guy couldn't say it. But you, you believe he got it. You know, he was like that person, he can't speak yet, but he's had the dream. Yeah. And you'll feel, sometimes you'll feel that, ah, oh, I get it, but I can't accept. And you've got to be true to yourself when you know something's deepening in you. And, um, and you can't hurry it. You just got to let, one of the images was the fetus has been gestated. Um, so, uh, you know it for yourself, you're, you're like a person who's mute and has had a dream, you know it for yourself alone. So suddenly, no breaks open, the heavens are astonished, the earth is shaken. It is as though you have snatched the great sword of the great general. When you meet the Buddha, you kill the Buddha. With a famous Zen kind of sayings, you know. You can't be a Buddha outside of you, eh? You know. Show me the hand of the Buddha. Yeah, don't be chicken shit, go for it. Hold it up! <laughs> oh. Yeah. It's kind of awesome, isn't it? Like the hand of, like, it's awesome. Like, can you feel that? How amazing that is? Like, wow. Um, huh. The heavens are astonished. <laughs> um, when you meet Bodhidharma, you kill Bodhidharma. No discrimination here, Buddha, Bodhidharma. You, you are, they, they can't exist outside of you. The very cliff edge of birth and death, you find the great freedom. You find the great freedom. In the six worlds, all the worlds of birth, you know, if you're a demon, a god, uh, an angry, uh, angry god, uh, an animal, a human being, a hungry ghost. In all the six worlds and all the ways of being born, you enjoy a samadhi, a deep meditation of frolic and play. How then should you work with it? I'm glad you asked, he says. Um, exhaust all your life energy on this one word, no. If you, if you do not falter, then it's done. A single spark lights your, kind of lights your candle, your atomic candle. So the um, and you can tell that you know, woman. He was just really wanting you to have that experience. He was passionate about it. You can tell. Um, I don't know. He just thought he just wanted to help, and he thought it would help. 
And uh, in fact, it usually does. You know, when you meditate, all sorts of troubles turn out not to have been real. So, very nice. Um, the long version exists in the Book of Serenity. Um, and uh, this the gave us the barrier was the second of the great common collections. The first one, uh, which we use the most, I suppose, is the Blue Cliff Record, which is a great compendium of koans and enlightenment sayings that are accumulating like autumn leaves on your hair and your shoulders and everything. So. And this one, and then the third great one is the Book of Serenity, um, uh, which we also study as a context. So, uh, just to say a few things about this. Um, you can tell that if you're just doing a con, it doesn't really matter what your con is, like, um, at some stage, I realized um, somebody once, who's now a close friend of mine, um, said, I just hate this con. No, you know, what? And um, I hate it. <laughs> and uh, so I hate this con, no. And, um, I need another one, and I said, no, no, no that's not going to help, but, <laughs> but after sort of a year or two of pleas about that, I said, no, it's only one way to prove it won't help, and, um, and so uh, I said, uh, uh, somebody asked you, man, what is Buddha, and you said, cake, <laughs> <laughs> and so um, he had to work with that for a while. And um, <laughs> it was kind of an endearing thing. I thought, well, I'll experiment. Yeah. And, uh, and then you'll see that people, cake, cake, yeah, cake. cake. <laughs> a particular kind of sesame rice cake is considered nice, especially nice, but yeah. And, um, or, you know, a, a friend of mine, I lost top contact with them, the epidemic, but a Tibetan uh, teacher, one of those people who, there was his lineage when he was born, he was assessed as a reborn uh, Lama, and then hyper-educated. And uh, they kind of got interested in Zen, and he said, uh, there's another <coughs> comment that goes, what is Buddha? Three pounds of flax, three kilos of flax. And he said, three kilos of flax? What does that mean? <laughs> now you tell, ah, I had him. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see the coins will something in the coin will stick to you and that's the good thing. It's like the trouble, like the fever coming to the surface and you realize there's something about life that's great and you just need to do. You know, you need to solve this matter. And it doesn't really matter how many lifetimes, I suppose. Like the guy who was a fox for 500 lives, he never quite forgot the fact that there's something possible, you know. He waits 500 lives before he finds the person who can release him. Kind of nice. And, um, and so then we get beyond success and failure. Uh, you know, we get beyond um, I don't know, whatever it is we think is important and uh, yeah and uh, and then the meditation becomes very rich, you know and then it doesn't matter if you have a really hard time that's sort of great in a way. If you're having a really hard day, just enter there. You know. The blue cliff starts out with uh, um, 
this great saying, knock on any door, someone will answer. It's going to go this typical sensibility of the blue cliff, actually. Knock on any door, someone will answer. If the door is, God, I hate this meditation. <laughs> Excellent choice. <laughs> Good door to knock upon. And you notice when you just enter here, when you stop refusing what the universe is giving you, everything opens. Yeah. And it's a matter of like, you might have tears, you might have, I don't know, lots of things. The dog, the liveliness of the dog, the dog will wag its tail, the liveliness of the dog will be there. Um, so I was thinking about a few examples of people, you know, people I know who had uh, <clears throat> like experiences that seemed noteworthy to them. And since I remember them, I guess they were noteworthy to me. And um, the, um, there was somebody who was kind of, she was, uh, you know, a pretty good student. Uh, she had a kid, and she really looked after a kid pretty well and stuff, but she was in the dojo a lot. And um, in Sashin, and then she, she said she, started, she got really, started, she smelled, the, the toilet, the place where we used to, used to, there was a toilet um, in this retreat center, somehow it always smelled of pee, you know, there'd been, um, <clears throat> there'd been a summer camp at one stage and stuff, and you just never got rid of the smell of pee from that room, you know? and, uh, and she went and she smelled the pee and just came and filled the universe, <laughs> and so, she said, hang on, something's happening. This is different from my usual reaction here. And that was okay. And then she went out into the, we were, the people who did uh, walking meditation as Todd will no doubt do with you, outside. And, uh, and it was through a redwood grove. And uh, she was walking behind the, I think behind the uh, <clears throat> timekeeper, the Jiki Jitsu. And, and, um, he had a black silk shirt on, and she just started falling into the patterns of the shirt, you know. Um, and she thought, oh, that shirt is not different for me either. And then the redwoods were not, and then she'd always, and then she felt, like, I'll never have a part of this mystery. I'll never, I'll never. <coughs> and then suddenly she realized, here it is. It's kind of nice. Simple thing, but here it is. And so when I tell stories like this, notice what your reaction is. You know, it, it doesn't matter what it is. I'll never do that. I'll never be able to do that. <laughs> Which is called desperately clinging to our unworthiness. <laughs> so, you know, lighten up a bit, take the ride. You know. But also, it's sort of interesting that you might recognize <clears throat> another person who's in this room um, had, a, had started to meditate, but something, uh, something had taken fire with her. And her life had been, she'd had a hard time for a while and um, used to weep in the dojo. And um, I said, well, if you can't weep in the dojo, where can you weep? You know? <laughs> you can laugh in the dojo, where can you laugh? You know? <laughs> but uh, and then, but then she heard, and she wasn't in session, but she heard <coughs> a train whistle far away, and something opened in her, and she knew it had opened. But she didn't tell anybody, but she came into the next session. She came into interview with me, and you just I could just look at her and see something had happened. And so I started to ask her questions about the common no, and she said this great thing. She said. She was incredibly annoyed, and she said to herself, what she told me, I think I'm probably mangling the story, she said to herself, um, if I'd known I was going to be subjected to an interrogation like this, I wouldn't have come. <laughs> <laughs> a very proper way of thinking. And then she realized, well, I don't have to answer it, the con can answer it, and then she could answer my questions. And it was so obvious to me that something had happened. It wasn't everything, and later on she had other experiences, but it was certainly enough 
to open the heart and have joy and have that comparing fall away, thing fall away. And she said that before that she'd walk into a room and she'd just be assessing everything and finding a problem with everything, you know. Anybody else ever had that experience? <laughs> so, so I, I don't know what I'm talking about, just to say it's not a rare thing waking up, opening your heart is not a rare thing. But it does like mess with who you thought you were. Because if you stop comparing and judging everything in the room, you have to stop being better than everybody. You find it very hard. And some white people's way of being better than everybody is to be worse than everybody. I'm terrible. It's not hard for me. Um, so, just saying. <laughs> so, so you can see that it does. It, it requires a, a transformation of the way of being in the heart. And, but it doesn't really require it so much. If you just keep flinging yourself into the koan, it, it'll give it to you. You get undeserved help on the way. But you don't have to be faithful to it. You just have to stop being so superior to, you know, if I, if I get in mind, I have to admit that I wasn't and I was faking it or whatever it was. You know. <laughs> or, you know, it was a little bit in mind, but it wasn't anything very much. You know. so, um, so, so you have to stop worrying about all that stuff and you just, the gates open and you're here. The gates of water. Does a dog have good in nature or not? And you can tell there's something, you know, as a as a philosophical question, I must say I don't think that's very interesting, you know, but um, but I suppose that's all from my side of things because I remember you know, people asking religious figures, do dogs get into heaven? Or, oh, I'm sorry, my child. <laughs> and uh, do priests get into heaven? No. <laughs> they become foxes. <laughs> but, um, very good. So, yeah. Um, there's something profound about the equality of being. The tree is equal to me and the, and the little woodlouse, you know, it's curled up in the damp places. I was thrilled to learn they have gills, they don't breathe, not insects, you know, things like that. Golden tool bugs or rolling polies or something. So there you are. There's your put in nature, right? <laughs> Reading through his gills, eating wood in a damp corner. It's a way to have been all living, you know, on this planet. <laughs> Global warming hasn't taken me out yet. <clears throat> so, yeah, so the put in nature and everybody you look at, just look around at somebody in the room. You know, you don't be chicken shit, look around, you know. <laughs> See, Buddha Nature is right here. Right here in San Rafael, we got a Buddha Nature. Yeah. And in your own heart, you know, the one who looks has what they're looking at. So I suppose, um, so don't, and, and also don't get too into achievement. The funny story I tell you about them be, digging the, the pit for the guy to throw him in and bury him alive if he didn't. Tell. He was clearly too hooked into I've got to achieve it. Right? You know, that was a way of solving it. Like, now I've completely failed. I'm midair. I'm going to be buried alive. Ah! <laughs> Finally, I can be here. You know? Seems an elaborate way to get there, but you never know. <laughs> Don't criticize other people's methods. You know? So, <laughs> so yeah. So, uh, but it's you. You know, it's you whose hand is the Buddha. Show me. Show me the hand of a Buddha. Yeah. One, uh, one teacher did a very touching um, <clears throat> response to that. He said, playing guitar in the moonlight. Show me the hand of a Buddha. 
playing guitar. And like, what are we going to do now? <laughs> Alison, I told one of your stories. Do you want to say anything about that? Or I interrogated I could. I just interrogated her just before I came in. I said, what was that story about the train whistle? <laughs> and I remember her, her like refusing to answer the questions and then quite happily answering them all. <laughs> Well, I think it wasn't, it wasn't that I, I refused, it was that I was so shocked and immediately just felt this sort of white wall of fear. It was sort of blinding fear of, of being wrong. And I just had no idea that that sort of situation would appear in the dose hunger. You thought it was supposed to be comforting. <laughs> I, I didn't think it would be that testing. And in my mind, that's what I imagined this question was, that it was a test. And that I didn't really care about getting it right, but I very much didn't want to be wrong. And so I felt immobilized by that possibility. And I thought, I just can't do this. I can't, I cannot answer. Allison cannot answer this question. And then this like little quiet voice was right back here that said, well, Allison can't answer this question. That's right. But Moo can answer it. And it just seemed, that's all right then. <laughs> Did you hear that? You can't answer the question, but the common can, you know. And uh, it's an interesting thing, and <clears throat> people have written about it as a testing and checking process, and. Japanese are very fond of examinations, which is something they inherited from the Chinese. And uh, you know, the whole examination scene in the literati tradition. <clears throat> there are whole books of the right phrase of poetry. You know, moonlight sweeps across the balustrade and no dust is stirred. That's the answer to some columns. <laughs> They're like little quotes of classic poetry. And, um, but, uh, at some stage I realized, no, it's not a test, it's a discovery process, you know. And it's an intimacy process because of you're discovering how do you see it? And how do you, you know, oh, you see it that, that way. Or for you it's in, you know, for it's in the center of P was the gateway, you know. Or the train whistle, you know. Could be, you, could be in danger of your life and that could be the gateway. And I can't, it's a funny thing. Um, uh, when I was going through that initial process where these questions are often asked, is a dog have good a nature or not? How big is a dog? <laughs> Things like that. And, uh, um, and uh, at some stage I realize, and I, sometimes your intuition can answer those things, but the teacher can tell that and doesn't give too much credit to it, you know. But um, at some stage I realized, oh, I knew all this. And it was a great thing, you know, it was sort of like bursting in me, you know. And I know I wasn't far from something, and then you feel it burst in you. And, uh, and also at that stage, it didn't matter whether God or not. <clears throat> That's the important thing. You stop being attached to the grasping, you know. This will save me. I'm sorry to tell you, nothing will save you. <laughs> Actually, it will save you, it saves the world too. That's how you save all the beings in the world, right? Yeah. But, um, yeah, and so then I realized, oh, and so I don't know, I just didn't want to go through and rush through and answer this question. So I just uh, went, out of the, went back and so in the back corner of the meditation hall, just listening to the birds and meditating and just laughing, you know. But I, I didn't know what was funny. It was just the laughter wasn't even mine. I was coming, I had to sit with that for a while. And, uh, and then I knew I could answer the questions, but I'd just take them one at a time so I could taste each one, you know. So that's what it was like. And I just found them. Instead of being some onerous final exam, I found them incredibly kind and generous because it started to show me what. So that's what I think, you know, this guy 
move in and he said, make your whole body, you know, all that stuff. He's doing, he's doing his best, you know, <laughs> so, being kind. And also, you can tell, when you hear that, you can tell, I have some of that in me, that Buddha nature is not not in me. I can tell that. Thank you very much. Please restore the hall.